Rabat, capital of Morocco, a 75-year-old woman is rushed to hospital. Her stomach is swollen and she's crippled with pain. Doctors think she has an ovarian tumor and take her immediately for an ultrasound scan. To my great surprise, we could only see a mass that was strange and bizarre. We said to ourselves, this woman is hiding something. The doctors are baffled, and to try and find out more, they send the woman for further scans. The radiologist is shocked by what he sees. Inside the stomach of the 75-year-old woman is a baby. But even more shocking is that this baby had been conceived 46 years before. In 1955, in a small village outside Casablanca, 26-year-old Zara Abu Talib was pregnant with her first child. I was very happy to be having this baby. I had cravings for everything. I had pains and bleeding. The baby wanted to come. But after 48 hours of painful labor, the baby was still not born. Zara was rushed to the local hospital. The doctor checked me and they said, if they didn't do a cesarean, then I wouldn't have the baby. But in the ward, Zara saw a woman in terrible pain die in childbirth. When I saw what happened to that woman, I couldn't stay there. If I was going to die, I would rather die at home. Convinced she would suffer the same fate, Zara fled the hospital and returned home to her village. I was like a crazy woman because I could not have a baby normally. I was in so much pain. In the days that followed, Zara suffered excruciating labor pains, but still the baby would not come. I stayed with my sister beside me, and she looked after me and said, if you don't give birth, I'll give you my daughter. I felt him moving, he gave me pain. He would move to this side and to the other side. That's the time, maybe, he was dying. After a few days, the pain stopped and the baby stopped moving. At a certain time, I couldn't feel him anymore. It was then that he started sleeping. Zara believed in a local myth known as El Racht, meaning sleeping baby, and that one day her baby would wake up. I could still feel him inside me, and I thought, if he wanted to stay sleeping, then I would let him stay. Soon villagers began to talk and came up with their own theories about what had happened to Zara's baby. They said, somebody must have cursed me. God only knows if that's true, but the baby never moved again. To try and forget the sleeping baby inside her, Zara adopted three children. Her children grew up, and had children of their own. 46 years later, Zara's excruciating pains returned. 
her adopted son became worried about his mother's deteriorating health. I started taking her to the local doctors. The pain was making her feel heavy. She felt ill. Sometimes she felt weak. I took her to doctors in Casablanca. We took her everywhere. We tried everything. Then we heard there was this doctor in Rabat. Racked with pain, Zara was barely able to make the grueling four-hour journey to the hospital in Rabat. Somebody knocked on my door. I opened the door to find an old woman who was exhausted. She had a protruding belly and was being supported by two people. Professor Uazani suspected Zara had an ovarian tumour which was causing her swollen stomach. He immediately took her for an ultrasound scan. When I saw the scan, to my great surprise, I discovered a mass that I couldn't identify. I couldn't even guess what it was. It was strange and bizarre. Zara's stomach revealed a mysterious white mass that looked nothing like an ovarian tumour. Baffled, the doctor sent Zara to a specialist radiographer for a second opinion. The only thing we saw on the scan was white. It was a calcified structure of some sort. We had no idea what it was. The mass was still a mystery. The radiographer performed a more detailed scan. He was shocked by what he saw. What he had discovered was a baby. The baby Zara had conceived 46 years before. He came back 45 minutes later with a scan in his hands. Pale, shaking. And he said, Professor Wazani, this is a pregnancy. In a hospital in Rabat, Morocco, an incredible discovery had been made. A scan of 75-year-old Zara Abu Talib's abdomen had revealed a baby conceived almost half a century before. Doctors could not believe what they had found. I was so surprised that I did a scan again. And it revealed a pregnancy. An ectopic abdominal pregnancy. Ectopic means out of place, outside the womb. In a normal pregnancy, the fertilized egg travels down the fallopian tube, implants and grows in the uterus. In an ectopic pregnancy, the egg implants in the fallopian tube. In extremely rare cases like Zara's, the fetus bursts out of the fallopian tube and then develops in the abdominal cavity. Most fetuses cannot survive past three months here. But Zara's fetus had somehow survived to full term by attaching its placenta to vital organs inside her stomach and remained there for a further 46 years. Mysteriously, a part of the fetus remained connected to the mother's blood supply and continued to grow. In 1955, when nine months pregnant, Zara thought she was in labor. But the pains she thought were contractions were the baby's distress as it was running out of oxygen. The baby died and somehow became entombed inside Zara until the day doctors discovered it 46 years later. We knew that this was a big event in medical history, exceptional. We thought there had never been a case like this before. 
We asked ourselves, how is it possible to keep a full-term fetus in her abdomen for so long? Professor Uazani was faced with the difficult decision of whether it was safe to risk surgery to remove Zara's fetus. In Zara's case, the danger was that she would bleed to death on the operating table as they separated the fetus from her vital organs. It took five days to decide on what to do. And the decision of whether to take this risk was not easy for me. I had to isolate a body from within another body and remove it. It was attached to her internal organs, bladder, stomach, veins. Anything could happen, especially with a 75-year-old woman. Despite the risks, Professor Wazani decided to go ahead with the surgery to try and remove the fetus and free Zara from pain. Zara was now faced with the caesarean she had run away from, terrified, so many years ago. But this was no ordinary delivery. Though doctors knew that Zara's baby was inside her, they had no way of knowing what it would look like or how difficult it would be to free it finally from Zara's body. When we opened the abdomen, we came across a mass under the skin. The surprise was to find a mass that was as hard as rock. It was like the scalpel was hitting a stone. They found that not only had the baby somehow turned to stone inside Zara's stomach, it had also fused with her abdominal wall and vital organs. The first attachments were so glued to the skin, we thought to ourselves, maybe we should stop. Despite the risks, doctors decided to continue to remove the baby from its tomb. The operation was to last for hours. At around the same time, and over a thousand miles to the north, in Suffolk, Jane Ingram was about to undergo an even more extraordinary and traumatic pregnancy. She and her husband, Mark, each had two children from previous marriages, and they now wanted to have a baby together. I found out, you know, we did the test, um, Mark and I did it between us, we found out we were... Um, we were pregnant, we all said we. <laughs> um, and it was just, you know, we were over the moon. So I thought, here we go. <laughs> One more. <laughs> but the next day, Jane began to experience strange pain and bleeding and went for a scan. She and Mark were told they were expecting twins. I was excited, I thought it was good. The nerves were playing a part because it was just the logistics of it all, you know, and nappies and feeding. It was very daunting, but I was looking forward to the challenge. I thought we'd be up for it. This was just the first of many dramatic developments. Although weekly scans showed the twins progressing normally, Jane was still bleeding and in great pain. We were coming from the ninth into the 10th week of pregnancy. It must have been about two, half past two in the morning, and I was like laying in bed and the pain woke me. I, I literally crawled along the floor into the bathroom where I managed to get onto the toilet and I had a huge blood loss and the pain, it was just the pain. I cannot tell, describe the pain. It was awful, absolutely awful. And I was just wringing wet with the sweat of the shock of it all. She literally collapsed in uh, pain and uh, covered in blood and I was I was very concerned not quite panicking but pretty close and I said Mark I'm dying I'm dying here that's it it's my lot you've got to get me to hospital I'm not gonna live I'm not gonna survive this this is not right this pregnancy is not right rather than wait for an ambulance Mark decided it would be quicker to drive Jane himself 
and every bump we went along on the road in the car we got and every bump and I thought God's sake just slow down and he's in a hurry I said it just hurts too much and I was crying and I said that's it I'm not going to survive this I'm not I just said I don't think I'm leaving he said don't talk like that and I, I was frightened I was frightened that that was it that was my lot At the hospital, doctors suspected Jane was having a miscarriage because of the extent of her blood loss and pain. She was taken for a scan where she and Mark prepared for the worst. But the twins appeared to be okay. It was a huge relief to see them alive. It was like two little spiders, <laughs> just legs and arms and like a little body and, you know, bouncing around. <laughs> on the scan, which was lovely to say. And I thought, well, you know, you saw the two heartbeats, you thought, well, they're still there, they're obviously holding on to their all. The doctor said, one does seem to be distressed, but not unduly. He said, it's probably just one of these things, don't panic about it, you'll see us things settle down if the blood stops or whatever, and it did. <laughs> The doctors were concerned enough to keep Jane in hospital under observation. After a week, everything appeared normal, and she was sent home. But the next time she came for a scan, the radiographer detected something very unusual. She was there for about five minutes, going over and over with the probe over my stomach. And I said, is everything all right? And she said, Mrs Ingram, she says, you're expecting triplets. I went, pardon? She said, it's three. It was just a shock. And I think out of everything that's happened to us, that is a shock I won't get over when I... Yes, you're having triplets, you're expecting triplets, you're having three babies. With four children to support already, Jane wanted to break the news of triplets to Mark face to face. And I said, I think you'd better sit down. And he said, well, no, what's happened? And he said, oh, don't tell me, he said, you've miscarried, that's the end of the pregnancy, because that's what he was thinking. And I said, no, I said, it's, it's much more than that. And he said, what's that? I said, it's triplets. And he just went quiet, and he just went green. His colour just went turned green. Chaps in the workshop were taking the mickey out of me, uh, you know, because it was twins straight off, and then it was triplets. Then uh, there was a big joke, I was a bit of a few jokes on that one, but that was great, that was a great feeling, magical. We went to bed that night, and I'm lying in bed that night, and Mark's sort of just going off to sleep, and all these things are going around and around in my head, and then I thought, just have a quiet moment, just reflect and have a quiet moment, and I just dug Mark in the ribs with the elbow, and I said, Mark, he said, what? I said, this pregnancy's still not right. It still doesn't feel right. There's still something wrong. I said, I know there is, and he said, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, he said, you're worrying over. I said, Mark, I said, it's not right. I said, it isn't because it's a triplet pregnancy. I still don't think it's right. What Jane and Mark couldn't have imagined was that this third baby was ectopic and had grown in her fallopian tube. The bleeding she'd experienced at 10 weeks had been caused by this tube rupturing. Normally, when a fallopian tube ruptures, it needs emergency treatment or else the bleeding can kill a woman in a matter of hours. In Jane's case, the bleeding somehow stopped of its own accord and her triplets continued to develop. But for the following four and a half months, Jane was frequently in excruciating pain. Experiencing pain in my right leg and my husband sort of trying to massage his leg for me to just like to ease the pain. And I said, I wish we never started this. <laughs> Tears were flowing and, but he kept, Mark kept me going. He just kept me going. He said, we'll get there, we'll do it, we'll do it. You know, we'll get there. At 28 weeks, Jane went for another scan. This time, the radiographer was worried about the position of one of Jane's triplets. She was referred to a specialist centre in London. Mark and I were discussing on the journey home. I said, well, if it's that serious, Mark, I said, they'd have me there and then, wouldn't they? They'd have me in hospital there, in, you know, in London there. And he said, yeah, he said, you're right. And as we walked through the door, the phone was ringing. It was the consultant's secretary saying, right, we've got an appointment for you tomorrow morning. I thought, blimey, perhaps it is. No, perhaps this is serious. 
Jane and Mark travel to London to the specialist pregnancy center at King's College Hospital. Jane's scan immediately caused concern, and leading ectopic specialist, Dr. Davor Yurkovich, was called in. You could see the seriousness on his face. He knew this was serious. He said, the radiographer at your hospital has saved your life. And I was like, well, what's happened then? You know, what's wrong with the pregnancy? And he said, one of the babies is in your stomach cavity. And I was just... What Dr. Yurkovich had detected inside Jane had never been seen or treated before in medical history. Well, it's one of the situations when you do a scan and you have to ask yourself, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing? The third pregnancy was very low in the pelvis, and I could see the cervix of the uterus. And behind the cervix, very deep in the pelvis, there was a third pregnancy. It was difficult to see because there were a lot of bowel surrounding the pregnancy, and bowel prevents ultrasound from obtaining very clear images. And it was very clear that this pregnancy is completely outside the uterus. What doctors now realized was that one of Jane's triplets had developed in her fallopian tube. The tube had ruptured at 10 weeks, but instead of miscarrying and causing critical bleeding, this third baby had miraculously attached its placenta to Jane's internal organs and continued to grow as normal. The ectopic placenta posed a risk to the lives of Jane and all three babies, as it was not only fused with her vital organs, but could rupture at any time, causing sudden and uncontrollable bleeding. We felt that there is a high chance that she may go into labor relatively soon. I told her that there are serious risks to her health and to the baby's health, and that we need to deliver her as soon as safe and, and practical. But Jane knew the next few days could be her last. Dr. Yurkovich wanted to admit her to hospital immediately. And I wasn't having any of it, because I thought, well, if I'm going to lose my life, I want to go back, see my children, see my mum, my dad, you know, my brothers. I said, this, I, I said, at least if I die, I've got this memory to take with me. And I promised them any signs, anything that wasn't right, I'd come straight back, I promised them. We're just trying to distance ourselves from what we're going to have to face. We thought, well, let's try and recharge batteries, get back into what family life's all about. Then we'll face it when the time comes. You've just got to support each other. It was a lovely day, but it was, it, it was strange. The energies, it was a strange day. And I was strong all day, and Mark kept looking at me. He was like, yeah, leave me alone, I'm fine, I'm enjoying myself. You know, this is how we went on. And that night, Mark and I went home. That night, Mark said, I'm just going to look up downstairs. You go off up to bed. I said, fine. I just sat on the bed, and I just broke down. And I thought, they've got to come out, and they've never done it before, you know, and how are they going to do it? And I just howled, and... And Mark came up and he said, thank God for that. And I said, what do you mean, thank God for that? You know, I'm breaking my heart here. And he said, it had happened. He said, you were being too strong, Jane. You are too strong. You've got, to, you've got to break at some point. He said, I'm glad you've done it now. Jane would undergo surgery that had never been performed before in medical history. Doctors estimated there was only a 60 million to one chance that Jane and all her babies would survive. I mean, you've got more chance of winning the national lottery. 60 million to one. Horrendous odds. Horrendous. After discovering the fetus that had lain inside Zara Abu Talib for nearly 50 years, surgeons decided to go ahead with the perilous surgery to remove it. The problem of extracting a body that has lived within a body for 46 years is not something to gamble with. 
Zara was forced to face her fears to undergo this dangerous operation. Of course I was scared. I was scared to death, even going to Rabat. In the old days, we didn't have operations. It is just my health that has failed me. If I hadn't been in pain, then I wouldn't have gone. Surgeons had no idea when they began the operation just how fused Zara and her baby had become. They began to separate the fetus from the abdominal wall before attempting the dangerous procedure of detaching it from Zara's vital organs. Any minor slip of the scalpel could have punctured these organs and cost Zara her life. The head was encrusted, pinned inside the bladder, and needed precision and meticulousness on our part to push aside the bladder without wounding it. There was a hand that was problematic because it was calcified and intertwined with the intestines. It took surgeons almost four hours to separate the baby from its mother. They worked carefully and cautiously and finally removed the fetus from its tomb. Zara survived the dangerous surgery and after 46 years, she had finally given birth to her baby. Doctors had never seen anything like it before. It was amazing. An incredible surprise. It was completely calcified. The fetus removed from Zara's stomach weighed seven pounds and measured 42 centimeters in length. It looked as if it was made of stone, yet eerily retained some of its human features. But to Zara, it was the baby she had been pregnant with so many years ago. I knew it was a baby. Even when the doctors told me it was just a lump, it was a baby. It was a child. Specialist pathologist Dr. Kitani examined Zara's fetus in an attempt to solve the mystery. What happened to the baby? And how did it remain inside her for so long? We, we recognize the head. The right arm is clearly visible. The fingers are perfect. Here we see the longer limb and thigh. I realized straight away that this was an authentic fetus. We recognized the head, one exterior limb was almost complete, as were parts of the exterior. I was astounded at how well conserved the fetus was, even after so many years. The duration and longevity of the pregnancy are something really extraordinary. Research has revealed that Zara's baby is a lithopedian, or stone baby. Only 300 cases have been reported in medical history. A stone baby results when a fetus dies during an ectopic pregnancy and is too large to be reabsorbed by its mother's body. The baby becomes a foreign body to its mother's immune system, putting her at risk of dying from infection or rejection. What is exciting about this case is the question of why there is this tolerance. Why did this alien body remain inside the mother for so long without projection? The mother's body protects itself by wrapping the fetus in a calcareous substance as its tissues die and dehydrate. As the calcareous walls build up, the fetus is gradually mummified, becoming a lithopedian or stone baby. Each stone baby is unique. This baby remained inside its mother's abdomen for 18 years in Brazil. In the Congo, surgeons removed this stone baby three years after it was conceived. 
Zara's stone baby is one of the oldest lithopedians ever to be removed. To unlock the secrets of how Zara's stone baby remained inside her for so long, Dr. Kitani has dissected the fetus. Here we see the brain, the spine, the kidney, the liver, and the digestive tract. And here you see the calcified layer around the fetus. This wall of stone has acted as a barrier between Zara and her baby for 46 years. It is a miracle. A miracle that she survived all of these multiple complications. Any of them could have killed her. She could have died from any of these things. Hemorrhage, infection, sepsis, and rejection. An ectopic pregnancy that reaches full term and remains inside its mother for 46 years is unprecedented in medical literature. After a final weekend with her family, Jane Ingram returned to London to face life-threatening surgery. Doctors would attempt to remove the two babies growing normally in her uterus and try to save the life of the third baby growing ectopically in her stomach cavity. You don't want to think of the worst. You try and think positively through everything. But it was at the back of your mind that if Jane uh, was to pass away and all the babies, you had got to be there for the rest of the children. I had to go through the plant procedure many times, consider all possible options. And for me, it was personal, it was a very emotional issue because the only abdominal pregnancy I've seen in my whole career before that, which was beyond 28 weeks gestation, was in the woman who actually died as a consequence. And I had this in the back of my mind when I saw Jane and was absolutely determined to avoid such a disastrous outcome in her case. I said, I've got to survive this. And he knew that and he knew how much it meant. Davil knew how much it meant to me to survive. But I did say to him, I said, I said, don't feel a failure if I don't. <laughs> I, I had to get that across to him. I said, because it, the odds against us, they were just stacked against us. There were specific worries that the ectopic triplet would not survive the operation. A paediatrician come to me and said, there's 99.9%, .9 these were exact words, that he would die, he wouldn't survive this. And I said, I don't want to hear. At the moment, he's still alive, he's still inside me, you know, if he's got this far, he'll go a lot further. On the morning of the operation, Jane and Mark said their goodbyes. We had to have a sign, we had to have something. And I just said to him, you just tell me that you love me. When I come round that way, I know I've got through it. So I was just walking alongside the trolley until he actually, he actually went in the theatre. They said, well, you can't go any further, you know, beyond these doors, which is fair enough. You know, I know the procedure, so... Just had to go around the other side of the hospital and uh, wait, a long wait. The ectopic placenta was so attached to Jane's vital organs, it would be easy to rupture it during the operation, causing massive internal bleeding that would kill both mother and all three babies. A team of 26 specialists had been gathered in order to cope with any number of critical situations that could have happened. High volume blood loss, organ failure and cardiac arrest. We decided to make a relatively large cut on her abdomen, which will give us enough space to manipulate the babies and deal with the major bleeding should the bleeding occur. Two baby girls, Olivia and Mary, were delivered from Jane's uterus first. The movement of their delivery alone could have disrupted the ectopic placenta. 
After the two babies had been delivered safely from Jane's uterus, the most dangerous part of the operation began, finding and delivering the third baby from Jane's stomach cavity. Once uterus is emptied of the two babies and shrinks in size, the placenta of the third baby, which was attached to the uterus from the outside, could be disrupted. And just the process of uterine shrinkage could have actually caused bleeding inside the abdominal cavity. I was sitting outside the corridor, literally where the operating theatre was. You're sitting there and your whole life could potentially fall apart. You know, you could lose your partner, the kids, and then you have to restructure your whole life. It's, it's, it's so hard to explain. It's like, it's like a vacuum. You're just like living in a vacuum. But um, at the same time, his fingers crossed, you know, just, just trying to stay positive, think, well, you can do this, you can do this. You've just got to hang in there. The surgeons began to search for the third baby. I knew exactly where the baby is and how baby is lying, but I couldn't see it because it was completely covered with the loops of bowel. We managed to remove the bowel to enable us to identify the fetus. We made a very tiny cut, not more than four or five centimeters. And I just managed to grasp his, his bottom and his legs. And I gently eased him out through this uh, hole. The critical part of operation was not to interfere with the placenta, because any disruption of placenta blood supply could cause severe hemorrhage. And if this happens, it is often impossible to contain the bleeding. After two tense hours, the third baby, a boy they named Ronan, was born. But his placenta was so fused to Jane's vital organs that to remove it would have killed her. Dr. Yurkovic had no choice but to leave the placenta inside Jane. Davor came out and told me everything went very well and I was over the moon, I was so relieved. And then he told me I'd go and see Jane in recovery, so I went in to see Jane. And uh, she was in a lot of pain, which is understandable, you've got, but you've got to be alive to feel pain. And uh, I was there to tell her I loved her. I felt this searing pain in my stomach, and I'm just going, pain, the pain, I'm shouting out the pain, and I think I was coming round. And I heard Mark saying, I love you, Jane, and I thought, oh, I've made it then, and that was it. I was, God, I don't remember much more. Well, for Jane, really, it was kind of unknown territory. Uh, she, was, she was still very ill, even after the operation. She was still very, very low. The triplets were immediately taken to intensive care. As soon as we finished the operation, we were focused on the babies, because we had no idea where the babies would be healthy and able to cope with the extrauterine life or not. Born two months premature, the babies weighed less than two pounds each, were unable to breathe independently, and were vulnerable to infection. Even if Ronan survived the crucial first weeks of life, he could have been left with lasting mental and physical damage from the abnormal way he had grown inside his mother. It was just the size of them. They were just so small. It, it was hard to get your head around it. I knew they were going to be small, but when you actually see them physically, I mean, it's unbelievable. You can, you can fit them in the palm of your hand, no problem. I mean, that's head to toe. They would fit in the palm of your hand. Tiny, absolutely tiny. I remember being wheelchaired into this special care baby unit and... I remember holding Ronan, and they were so tiny, yet they were so hairy. They were like tiny little baby monkeys. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe them, really. And I remember spending some time with them. Not very long. I was just watching it. I was just fascinated that they'd got through what they'd got through. Although she had survived the surgery, Jane's life remained in danger from the placenta left inside her. I felt very relieved and very happy, but once you resolve one problem, you think about the other one. 
So I was worried about possibility of delayed hemorrhage. Then I was worried about possibility of infection, possibility of sepsis, which is also a very serious complication which can endanger mother's health. The triplet's birth was in itself a medical miracle, but their survival depended on their progress in the weeks that followed in intensive care. And I mean, they can get very ill very quickly. So it was still like you were skating on thin ice. It, you weren't quite there yet. You weren't quite out of the woods yet. When the operation to remove the baby that had lain inside Zara Abu Talib for 46 years was safely completed, she could finally grieve the child she had tried to forget. On a psychological level, it is my belief that there was a certain sadness. She was mourning for her dead child. This is quite normal for a woman who was pregnant, when to deliver, and then had to put this child out of her mind. She had to relive this pregnancy when the baby was finally removed. I wanted to have a child of my own, to be a happy woman, but God did not will this for me. In a twist of fate, it was Zara's fear all those years before that probably saved her life. Lack of technology in 1955 meant that Zara's doctors had no way of diagnosing that her baby had grown in her abdomen. Had doctors attempted a cesarean, they could have cut through the placenta attached to her organs and Zara could have bled to death. I can forget now and put everything in the past. Zara knows how lucky she is to have survived and to be able to enjoy the rest of her life with her adopted children and grandchildren. Ectopic pregnancies rarely have a happy ending, but against odds of 60 million to one, Jane Ingram and all three of her triplets survived. After 10 weeks in intensive care, the triplets were finally well enough to go home. Despite fears about the placenta left inside her, it eventually shrunk and Jane made a full recovery. Today, the triplets are almost six years old and amazingly, all three have developed normally, both mentally and physically. They've all got their own little character. Ronan likes to be into everything. He's a little rascal. Olivia, far more sensitive, and Mary's more of a joker. So they've all got their own little personalities, which I wouldn't want to change. When I want to grow up, I want to be a fairy. You want to be a fairy? When I want to grow up, I want to be a piece I get danced. <laughs> Ronan Ingram defied impossible odds to survive an ectopic pregnancy. He has since astonished the medical world by developing completely normally. He's always been different. He's a normal child in every sense, in every way, but he's very much an individualist. And I'm a peace lady. You're going to be a peace lady, and what are you going to be? And, and a hair. And a hair. I'm a vampire. Get married to vampires. <laughs> I think Ronan was a strong little boy anyway from the day he was conceived. He was meant to be here, he wanted to do it his way. He wanted to prove the medical profession wrong and he did. The Ingram survival was a medical miracle, but it could have been a very different story. Once detected, pregnancies growing outside the womb can't normally be allowed to continue as the risks to the mother are too great. Had Ronan not stayed hidden from view during the first part of Jane's pregnancy, then he would never have been allowed to develop as he did. It would be very dangerous 
to assume, bearing in mind Jane's experience, that it would be reasonable to allow pregnancy within fallopian tube, which looks superficially normal, to progress in a hope that it will end up with a healthy baby. The risk to the mother is so high that entertaining such a pregnancy would be completely unjustified. Where's Ronan? I don't know, he's gone right over the back up there. In 1955, there was nothing that could have been done to save Zara Boutalib's baby. But thanks to modern medicine and the doctor's skill, Jane and Mark Ingram can now enjoy life with their miracle triplets. You've got to stay together. You've got to be strong for each other. You've got to support each other. There's no point uh, being half-hearted in anything. You've got to focus totally on what you've got to do. See it as a challenge. For whatever reason in life you've been given this challenge, you just have to rise to it and do it. Because there's always somebody worse off than yourself somewhere in the world. So there's no good being down on yourself or negative with each other. You've got to be positive, be strong. <laughs>